My name is Albert Mamprey. I'm usually referred to as Al Mamprey. And uh, I live in Skokie, Illinois. I was married but lost my wife. And I had three young ladies, girls. And uh, uh, so I was there when we were just forming. And I was an infantryman uh, for a while. And the, um, uh, then they, after that was formed, then they go to form that they were forming the medical detachment and asked me if I wanted to be a medic. I said, oh yeah, I'd love to be a medic. And from then on, I was a medic all the way to Birch's Garden, Bastogne, Germany, Holland. I wasn't in Normandy because I had a big cyst that came around. They were going to choke me out. They sent me to the just before Normandy. Uh, it was not about a week and a half, two weeks before Normandy. I was still there. I was there about a month. I was digging in at me and um, in, in essence, that's me. I'm now uh, 96 years old, and uh, one of these days, one of these upstairs or downstairs is going to say, hey, who want this one? But you got a birthday coming up. Yeah, the 25th of May. And you'll be 97. I'll be 97. How many, how many times over the last almost 75 years do you think you've, you've talked about Easy Company? Oh. Thousands? 75 years? No, last 20 years. Last 20 years. The last 20 years you've talked about it a lot? Yeah, well, well my friend uh, Ed Pepping, I don't know whether you know him. Well, Ed Pepping was the first guy I met, and he had just gotten there that same day at the Court of George, and we went out to a field, and uh, uh, he became a medic, and uh, I had him assigned to a company, e, and uh, so he was in company e until he got badly racked up in Normandy, and then they sent him to a hospital, and then he worked in that hospital. <laughs> uh, but we talked every day, practically every day since then. No, 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 for about the last 30 years. And, but I would have a, there was another medic that lived in my area, and, uh, but when we got together, we didn't talk about the, the war at all. We just talked about our family, jobs, things like that, you know. It wasn't until the Band of Brothers came out and everything, and my family had grown up, the kids were out of college, and I could pay attention to that kind of stuff. When you were healing from your wounds, so you missed D-Day, did you, did they rib you for that? No, nobody saw anything. Especially those that went there and came back. It was such a monumental change in the war. It was certainly so. And our confusion in that jump, I think, helped save us too. There was, you know, battalion, I mean, I'll tell you, there was regimental officers, there were generals by themselves almost on that jump that night. And uh, that's one of the reasons I wanted to be an airborne. I wanted something daring, and I wanted to, and our generals I knew didn't stay back there somewhere. They're right then there with you. I wanted that leadership right with us. And uh, it's the thing that makes a difference. Training and respect for each other. So that's what? Dick Winters. What happens, Mr. Mompre, after Operation Overlord, the, the D-Day invasion, and then it's how many weeks before you join them? Well, they then come. They were just coming back as I got back. I can't remember what the day when it was. It was before Holland. Uh, Talk to me about that jump into Holland. That was a that was a heck of a thing for you. Beautiful day, but uh, not for me. Yeah, I jumped. Uh, and uh, when I hit, when I was about 75 feet off the ground, they, um, uh, this fella came through my chute. And I say that number because the, the, the ground hadn't started doing this. It's like this is what happens. It doesn't feel like you're falling. It feels like everything's getting larger. It's like when you come down the expressway, uh, you see these buildings getting bigger. <laughs> We're just getting closer. Um, so, uh, and then I hit hard, and he landed right on top of me, hurt my back, and then I I'd volunteered to jump on experimental shoot for us, and I was with a buckle 
in the center to hold all four straps. I just turn, quarter turn, ping, push it. I was out. I'd have still been there trying to get out, trying to unhook. Okay. Anyway, and uh, they, uh, I don't know how far you want me to go with this. No, just go ahead. Well, then we're going into what happened right after that. Yeah. Yeah. The, well, the first day I stayed in, the first day, uh, well, we were being fired at. And oh, first day I finally got off the field and uh, by myself. I could still get around. And uh, the, Susan, the people in Zod all came out in their best finery and waving their arms and flags. And, um, uh, and uh, suddenly a machine gun, German machine gun, opened up down the street. Well, they took off like that. They'd been there, done that. And uh, I stepped back into a doorway. And this shows you how terrible war can be. A woman's head him, came out with a spoonful of cherries and was feeding me cherries. Machine gun bullets were going past past me. I never saw her, didn't meet her. All I saw was that arm. I'd recognize the arm, you know. But because uh, when the firing stopped, somebody must have got him anyway. We, uh, I took off. So, and then the next day, I was, the next night, well, that first night, I was sleeping, I was looking for a place to sleep, and I saw this building in the dark way back. Oh, there was a motorcycle on the highway, brand new kind of bike almost, and it was uh, probably a BMW that put on my motorcycle, and we were, nobody's going to touch it because it could be booby trap. Why would a nice motorbike sit right in the middle of it? And most highway one of the lieutenants jumps out and starts it up and drives away. They're the ones that were telling us not to drive it. We could have been there. Any one of us could have had that. Mm -hmm. then I, I saw a German go over the wall, and uh, these were getting away. They were getting away. The, uh, oh, anyway, I went to this house, real dark. I opened the door. Now, the Dutch rural areas, they had one long building. Half of it was house, half barn for the animals. And I'd opened the one with the, with the barn for the animals. Well, I went in there, straw on the floor, I lied on it, slept all night. And then uh, when I got up in the morning, there was a big, furry wall against me, and uh, nuzzling up against me. And I looked this way, there was no end. I looked that way, still my hairy something. And finally I got enough uh, perspective to see that it was a big pink, huge parker, huge. If he'd rolled over, I'd have been this thick, <laughs> about that wide, you know. But then we had three of my buddies who were in the house in bed. Tell me about the camaraderie within Easy Company. Well, they were formed as a team. And as first, the first um, uh, feeling of, a, of an aggregate group of guys becoming a, a band or being formed, being um, abandoned, was uh, with um, Sobel, negatively, against their captain. Because he, he was a mean son of a guy, even to his own officers. He would change orders and then give him hell for not following the new order. And they didn't even know about it. And stuff like that. And uh, he uh, was going to train his unit as hard as he could so his could be the best in the, in the regiment. And uh, Sink, the, uh, Bob Sink, the regimental commander, wanted to be the best in the Army, his regiment. So you got double trouble there. Anyway, that's why we were trained pretty hard. And, and then he went beyond that. And um, the only problem with him was he couldn't tell where he was. He couldn't get out of, find his way out of a paper bag. He's just terrible. And that's kind of, but top training, oh boy, you know how to train him. So uh, they went up, three sergeants went up against him. They didn't want to go into combat with him because he said they'll, he'll get them all killed. And uh, first I thought there was going to be a mutiny. Well, I know the three sergeants. They're not going to mutiny. This is E Company. And uh, so the, the whole thing developed that then he finally pulled him out and put um, uh, Dick Winters in there. And Dick Winters was the abs absolutely opposite. He had a lot of resent, resent, 
respect for the people that were his people, and he had he was firm but fair, and they knew that. They also knew that he wasn't a drinker or anything like that. Didn't drink, uh, and that he did a lot of studying, tactics and stuff like that when he was downtime. You know. So the um, attitude switched to where they become a positive, really ready from really training under winter. And uh, Mike Rainey was one of the sergeants, and his grandson asked him, were you with a band of heroes? He said, no, but I was with a band of brothers. Henry the Fourth, I think. This guy was pretty well read. Yeah. And uh, matter of fact, went out, went out the field to take care of this wounded lieutenant who was out there by himself, shot through the neck. He thought he was John Wayne. He's waving his map. Case. Come on, guy. He was a tall, skinny guy like Ted Danson. And uh, he, um, and uh, Captain, uh, Captain um, Winters uh, told him not to do that. They were asking for it. He said, because they know that's an officer, they're going to plug him, you know? Well, that, didn't, that wouldn't have disrupted us, other than the fact that. Uh, we do need somebody in direction. But uh, we were kind of like an entrepreneur army. We had a mission, and you knew what the mission was. Now it's up to you to solve it. Um, you know, accomplish your mission. So you have to focus on that mission, nothing else. Focus on your mission. So we were trained hard for that. And also that you have to work together. Now out on the street in the old days, as a civilian, you probably wouldn't even say hello to this guy. You might not even like him at all, but he's right next to you. You better work as a team. And so you have to respect each other's capabilities and willingness to pitch in with you. And that's when the Band of Brothers started coming in the picture. And you were so young, you were 22, 20? 20, 21 I went in. 21? 20. 20, and then by 44, you're what, 22? when you're dropping and you go through Operation Market Garden. At the end of 44 into 45, I don't need to tell you, the Battle of the Bulge, how? Well, it was there too. How? We thought. How cold. It was cold. I've never been back to, I've been to Holland a number of times, I've been to Normandy, but I've never been to uh, Bastro. I went through Belgium with my wife in 1948. That's all. Uh, we spent the whole summer there. In Europe. Anyway, um, Bastogne, I went into Bastogne with a jump jacket, no, with a uh, flight jacket that my brother gave me in England, and a uh, little collar and cloth. That's it, nothing else, no jump jacket, no, no sweater, no nothing. And a lot of them were like that. They were hurting. I could see the eyes on me when uh, shelling started. If I got hit, that jacket would have been off before. I could hit the ground. Uh, yeah. So I was didn't have anything. Most of them. To, oh, what I wanted to specify was, it was an absolute shock to me to see lines of American troops going away from the battle. I couldn't comprehend it, and it didn't really hit me really that hard till the last year or so. Now oh, those guys are going. We're going the other way. Why are they going back? Well, they were in bad shape. They, a lot of them didn't have weapons. And they must have thrown them away or something. I don't know what. And uh, oh, they were ready to leave. There were the lines on both sides of us going back. I'll never forget that. When people think of the Battle of the Bulge, they are, are we, any of us, able to comprehend just how close that was to going either way, right? I mean, that. That's pretty well had us modeled in and we weren't giving up. Like that, so I heard that one officer said, we're surrounded with those poor bastards, meaning they, the Germans are in trouble. That was an attitude, you know. But we were down to nothing, practically nothing. And one guy, everybody did what they had to do. When uh, one guy that took care of over a thousand wounded in uh, at a big building there in Bastogne was a was the regimental 
a dentist, Samuel Plyler. That guy didn't look like an uh, army guy at all, a little bit pudgy, and uh, he didn't understand the army at all. His idea of an order is, go that way, go that way. <laughs> no life to left turn or right turn, nothing. So, um, but he did that. And people, a cook knocked out, they, they ate at the river there in Zan. So everybody was pitching it. You have to do that. You know what your mission is? Just clear that bridge if you can. Open up the road for the British to come up the road. <coughs> the British are something again. They were, they were uh, really tough, but they had to sort things out. If there was a problem, they had to wait for orders and all this. We know what the mission was. And McAuliffe, very rightly so, I think, also told his officers what the mission was. Now you go ahead and handle it. You know, he gave them latitude to solve these problems where they could be solved. Uh, Taylor went that way. Uh, he was the major general. Um, the, uh, what they going to Let me ask you about the notoriety that has come with the Stephen Ambrose and book yeah. and the Band of Brothers and all of that. That's what's brought this all on. <laughs> yeah, whether you like it or not. Well, it's embarrassing to me and to most of the guys that were involved in that. How come? Well, the focus is on you, but I realized, well, I'm a soldier, much later that the actual, um, you know, thanks are for, for all of us that were there and not just me. You know, this isn't you, it's who you're representing. And once I got that sort of acceptable to myself, to buy that thing we had today, oh man, that was something, that was something. Yeah. So it makes it a little easier, but it is embarrassing. They probably thought I was, all, I was going to jail. They took all those guys to get me there. <laughs> well, you came to Denver, and when you, when you get to the airport and, and you get off the plane, what was that like? Absolute shock. I saw them, and they're all looking at me. I'm looking around, there's nobody else. Gotta be me. And uh, they were cheering for you. Why were they? Yeah, that's, see, that's embarrassed. I'd like to get each one of you in that condition. It's not pleasant. But I appreciate it. A lot of effort went into, the, into all this, a lot. And you folks have reached out to me quite a bit too. So you, you, when you get back, you become, you go to uh, become a psychologist. Yeah. So with your training over the last decades, you can understand why people want to say thanks to you. You're, whether you like it or not, you're a legend. Yeah. Only because I'm on the side of the sun. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, that's like I said, this didn't become a, a factor in my life until after Ambrose's book. Then I started getting active with the organization. Went to some reunions. We were at a reunion one time in Milwaukee, and I haven't been to a lot of them. But anyway, uh, my wife is looking around, looking around. Says, what are you looking at? She says, how did you ever win the war with these guys? <laughs> <laughs> and what did you tell her? I said, you think we look bad, you ought to see the Germans. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> oh, she was full of fun. So, um, uh, what else do you want me to talk about? So, just a few more questions, and guys, do you all agree it's time for a water break? Yeah. Sure. Yes. I already went. No, not a pee break, a water break. Oh. You know, Doc, he's gonna make you drink. Yep, there you go. What, Ken? He's gonna make you drink more water. How many of you are gonna gang up on me? <laughs> you feeling all right? Yeah, this all started to happen after Holland, it was just too much, too much. There was 11 days of a lot of walking and everything. I, I just had my wheelie cart, you know, the wheeler, and uh, I didn't want to use a wheelchair because it would mean my daughter would be pushing it, you know. Well, 
I didn't want her to be pregnant. It's time for water. You're, you're delaying it long enough. Oh. <laughs> Think you're going to get away from it, did you? <laughs> and your daughter didn't tell me to do it either. Mm. Doesn't that taste just like the nectar of the gods? <laughs> uh, I never drank much water. I go on a 25 mile march and uh, drink only about half my canteen full of water. I begin to leave the water out, fill it with what you call a fruit cocktail. But you, did you, you say you landed with no water in? Well, I had this can, yeah. But that's it. No, I didn't have any. I had ethyl alcohol in there. Yeah. Yeah, two canteens full. And they called you Doc. Yeah, they all called all the medics Doc. How many people, could you even guesstimate how many wounded that you treated? No, there weren't that many, but too many. Yeah. Some of them, I can't understand why they weren't wounded. One guy got hit on the head with a mortar shell. Wham! Knocked him down. He was okay, probably got a concussion on him. Another guy, a bullet went right under his helmet, up his up his scalp, came out the other end. He was okay. And another guy, there was one uh, first sergeant that was, he came in and they brought him in. He was lying outside our drawer, all frozen. There was a 50 caliber bullet lying on his check. And he was shot by our own strafing P-51. Yeah, because we were that close to the German. Can you tell me, Mr. Montpre, how Obviously, none of us were there. You were the only one, so you are our source. But at times during battle and what you'd see, what did it smell like and look like and sound like? Well, in the cold, well, when you're not in a cold area, it smells bad. And uh, it's, see, you don't get that in these movies. All they get is two-dimensional. And uh, people think they know a little bit about war, but only a little bit. It's all this other stuff that makes it. And when people actually lose an arm, one guy, a shell hit just outside his foxhole and tore his arm off and it landed right across the edge of the foxhole and his buddy in the foxhole pulled on it and there's nobody on the end of it. He went into shock. Now he wasn't shot or anything, but he went into shock. But the guy with the lost arm, he was lamenting it because that's his worst watch, watch was. He was in shock, you know. Things, oh, legs. The guy that took my place as a sergeant uh, went, was diverted into a Belgium hospital and he got uh, gangrene and so he lost his leg. I want a leg wound. Mine didn't bleed hardly at all. It was cut all the way down the bone. And the Dutch, oh, the Dutch, they come running out to help you. They are something. And then they end up taking, they come out with a long ladder. And put, I uh, put uh, Bob on the ladder and the drawer, and take him to the houses across there. There are four houses there, and uh, field. Oh no, the Germans over there. So I was want to go back to my unit. Well, I meant how to get there. Well, there were three other wounded company E guys that tried to save us, and so I had four wounded. Well, the, the medic came out there, supposed to be out there. And then, as I see it, and uh, he got clipped in the heel by a bullet, and he took off back to the woods where Kabi was. And uh, when, I, when I first when I heard, or first heard the call that they wanted a medic up at Company E, I said, I got four medics in there. Why do they? My wife said, I'm going in there, we're right behind it right behind them, and they were pointing out to the field, pointing to Bob Brewer, and I, I asked him who it was. So I walked out the best I could, because I was hurting from the jump, and uh, <clears throat> sat down and told him who I was, and then mixed my own, uh, my own uh, plasma. We did that right on the field, right with the window. And then, uh, and then I just had it mixed, and I heard a crack. The Germans opened up on us again. And I thought somebody had broken the model with a bullet. It was right up here, gravity field. You know? And I was looking, no, it's okay. 
know, more bullets kicking up all around. That's when the other medic got hit. Had a three word hit. And uh, I, uh, I lie down next to Brewer and I, my best uh, bedtime uh, uh, manner. I said, Are you dead, Lieutenant? Because if you are, I'm leaving. He said, He croaked out, No, but I don't, I don't know why not. I said, Okay, I'll stay with you. Well, then they took him that way. Well, then they want to take my boot off. I wouldn't let him because the cut was just above the boot and just laid up like a lamb roast or leg lamb or something all the way down the boat. So, uh, do you do you have you questioned why why do you think you made it? Well, in the first place, I don't think Will has that much to do with it. I never I never thought I'd die. I never thought I'd die. But as I was pointing out, little things would knock him out. You know? Yeah, I don't know. Providence is another. You could, you could say all kinds of things. Or oh, it wasn't meant to be, or all those kind of things. But I've been almost, in Bastogne, I almost got blown to smithereens. A shell came down and just broke away. It was big pieces. Uh, my thought at the time, I remember this, oh, that was a big shell. Must have been a big shell. And I didn't think anything of it. If that had exploded, Jupiter, I would have known, Saturn, I would have known them all about it. <laughs> but uh, who knows? Providence, like you said, um, do you consider yourself, even with that sh shared story, do you consider yourself a pretty lucky guy? Yeah. yeah. I think I've been lucky. Met so many nice people. That's what's come out of it. I met, I have very good friends that are law enforcement people, DEA, DEO, D, -E drug enforcement officers and uh, FBI, uh, police um, captains uh, and uh, chiefs and guy on the street. And uh, the only people I don't know I know are CIA. They don't tell you. <laughs> yeah, they don't. You did have a chance recently, though, to meet Vice President Mike Pence. Tell me about that. Well, that was a, we were in the White House and uh, this fellow Tony had arranged for all this. He's a park policeman from Washington, D.C., which is a, the department responsible for security in Washington. So uh, I got their ride helicopter, simulated ride, drive one of their big, fast, not big, small, fast boats out in the Chesapeake, and then got to see Mike Pence. And he had us in there, and we got to see him. Saw the Secretary of Army. Uh, uh, and he, at first we talked in the big office, and then he said, anyway, let's go in my private office. So we went in his private office, and uh, he pushed me with my wheelchair into the private office. <laughs> and I liked him immediately. Straight arrow, like I said earlier. Just what you see is what you get. We could use him to follow up, as I'm concerned, to, to Donald Trump. Now, Trump is not what everybody says. My daughter's met him, she's seen him, she's talked to him and everything uh, in Houston. It was at the opening before he was president. So um, uh, So that was a good meeting with, with the vice president? Oh, my goodness. That's he, terrific. And, uh, he said to my daughter, not me, if you need anything, just call me. That's great. Let me ask, just a couple more questions, and you've been so kind with your time. Over the decades, have have you been haunted or traumatized? You know, post-traumatic stress. You probably have heard of that. Once, once. I was at uh, on board a ship on a tour down the coast from New York to up the coast to Halifax, and they had a movie on called uh, Sully. You know about that guy that landed in the Hudson, and they were flashbacks in the way they did the movie. And uh, I suddenly had a flashback. I could feel the, see the bullets hitting all around me. And uh, actually, and this lasted just a few seconds, but I was there. And it was 74 years later. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 74, 74 years later. 74 years. Yeah, that was Scully, when he was watching yeah. the movie Scully. Yeah, 
now I know how they really feel. You know, I was treating them, but you know, I've been there, done that, but just for one time. Okay, this is the obligatory question I ask most veterans I interview. How do you want to be remembered? Oh, I was a good father, grandfather, yeah. How about a hero? And, uh, no, I don't see my, ask any of us if they were here, Ed, Ed Hepburn. And, Ed Tipper? Ed Pepper. Ask, oh, Pepper, uh, yeah. Uh, Wild Bill Gardner, ask any of those guys, Compton, ask any of them, they don't feel that way. They feel they're do, doing what they're supposed to do, period. Is uh, it okay though if we think you're a hero? You can think what you want. You can <laughs> think, but don't tell me in front of me. I wouldn't want to hear that. Well, welcome to Colorado, sir, again. I know oh, you've been here before. And yeah. Thank you so much for your service and sacrifice. What a pleasure and honor to meet you. Well, the people here are absolutely Wonderful folks, wonderful folks. We just want to keep on having you drink more water and keep <laughs> drinking water. The boss is here. I had some water yesterday, didn't I? <laughs> God so bless you, sir. Next Thank thing you. I will be standing on my chest. Thank you.